The triple planetary crisis of climate change, nature and biodiversity loss, and pollution underpins the urgency and importance of international collaboration across all strands of society. Banks have a unique and critical role to play in pivoting the global economic system to redirect capital and accelerate the pace and scale of positive change across entire economies. In order to see meaningful changes at the heart of organizations, every single bank employee needs to consider responsible and sustainable practices in their day-to-day decision-making. From understanding more responsible lending practices, to learning how to work with their customers to help them green their businesses and offer sustainable products, banks and their employees are embarking on a journey of unprecedented scale. Therefore, we are delighted to introduce the Principles for Responsible Banking Academy, a unique online learning program designed for banking professionals all over the world. The Academy brings together the United Nations, the world's most established professional banking institute, and one of the largest organizations for international development cooperation worldwide. All of which, thanks to their many years of experience, are at the forefront of sustainable finance. Through education and training, the Academy will support banks in the global sector to align their professional practices with the UN Principles for Responsible Banking, the world's foremost framework for ensuring that bank strategy and practice align with the vision society has set out for its future in the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. The Academy will create a global network of responsible bankers, mainstreaming responsible banking and sustainable finance through capacity, capability and culture. This leading-edge educational program is the first of its kind, having been designed by industry experts in consultation with banks worldwide. The training program can be completed entirely online making it widely accessible to professionals worldwide. The curriculum is suitable for individuals at all stages of learning, whether beginner, specialist or at executive and board level. We believe that, through the learning opportunities offered in our unique curriculum, we can support the banking sector's transition toward a better future, one which is aligned with better practices, better decision-making and has a better impact on the world. If you want to be part of the change and register your interest in the Academy, please visit our website at www.prbacademy.com. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody, wherever you're joining us from in the world. As Chair and President of the Chartered Banker Institute, it's my very great pleasure and privilege to be introducing today's virtual conference. It's the first of two short days discussing responsible banking and how the banking sector and community are interpreting it, both within their organizations and as individuals in these challenging times. This is the seventh time the Charter Banker Institute has hosted such a conference, but it's the third successive year when we're holding the conference virtually. That allows us to reach as many of our members around the world as we can, and it also helps others to join us from other institutes around the globe today. You're all most welcome. Let me start my remarks by saying that although this conference will be primarily focusing on responsible banking over the next couple of days, I've looked around and there is in fact no official definition of responsible banking, but the Institute does have its own short definition of what a responsible banker is. A responsible banker is one that is clear on what is the right thing to do in the interest of society, the environment and for their customers. So I trust everyone watching is happy to consider this topic of responsible banking with this in mind. And no doubt we will touch on many of these characteristics throughout the course of the next two days. Anyway, moving on to today's, to today's proceedings. In a moment, we'll be discussing what responsible banking looks like in a global inflation climate. And tomorrow we'll be looking at why responsible banking values matter, with a particular focus on how the UN principles for responsible banking are being implemented by banks who have signed up to them, and how the new principles of responsible banking academy is supporting that endeavor. So please sit back with a coffee or whatever drink takes your fancy at this time of day and enjoy what I hope will be two very enjoyable, thought-provoking days, looking at most aspects, if not all aspects, concerning responsible banking and the challenges and opportunities they're presenting to banks and bankers. Now, for those viewers who may not already be aware, the Charter Banker Institute was founded in 1875, so we have nearly 150 years of experience in educating bankers 
and with a network of over 33,000 professional bankers around the globe, we're proud to be regarded as the voice of responsible and sustainable professionalism in banking, with a focus on a responsible banking agenda, emphasizing the importance of education, skills, and training in banking. We were one of the first UK organizations to endorse the UN principles for responsible banking, and we also support the wider attainment of the UN sustainable development goals. Our work in supporting how banking can play its part in meeting the environmental challenges that the world faces has led to the development of a unique global academy with the United Nations Environment Programme Finance Initiative. The PRB Academy, which is covered in the video you just saw, officially went live yesterday, and it will provide professional training for banks and their staff on sustainability and social issues, framed in the context of the UN principles for responsible banking and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The objective of the PRB Academy is to give all bankers from the back office to boardrooms the tools needed to apply a sustainability lens to their professional activities. Alongside this, the international influence and collaboration we have been building through our partnerships with professional bodies in Africa, Australia, the Bahamas, Hong Kong, India, Ireland, Malaysia, Malta, New Zealand, Pakistan, and Taiwan, to name quite a few, has been a continued focus of the Institute. We're now proud to have students and professionally qualified members in 107 countries across six continents, all of whom share a common commitment to the Chartered Banker Code of Professional Conduct and to our global family of members. It's great to have so many of you able to join us online today for this conference. And thank you once again for your invaluable contribution to making the Institute such an important community. I particularly like to pay tribute to our international partner institutes, the AICB in Malaysia, Finzia in Australia, and also thank the Global Ethical Finance Initiative, better known as GFI, and last but not least, UNEPFI in particular for supporting this event for the next two days. I give a warm welcome to all our members and all those associated with them for joining us today. It's a partnership like this that underlines the strength of our banking community and long may it continue. We certainly find ourselves in a challenging environment as businesses and individuals. The first pandemic for almost hundred years is still with many countries and war has broken out in Europe for the first time in 25 years. The impact on commodity prices has had a profound effect on living standards in the developed world and on heightened poverty in many developing nations. Recessions, inflation and a squeeze on real earnings are a tricky combination for banks. On one level, banks want to support their customers, be they personal or business, so that they come out the other side ready to enjoy the recovery. But at the same time, there is moral hazard in lending more when affordability is tight and getting tighter. And there, is a, and there is a need for a duty of care to shareholders and depositors whose money is at risk. One can also argue that there is a duty of care not to let customers become stretched financially. But that's a very hard call when much of the recent increase in credit card debt, at least in the UK, is not for luxury holidays, but to put food on the table and energy in the meter. The scale of economic challenge seems to be growing by the day. And whilst one can point to global instability for pressures in the supply chain, it is clear that there are winners and losers in this evolution and that the extremes are probably wider than they have ever been and, only, and can only be narrowed by fiscal intervention at both ends of the system. Interest rates have and are rising across the world as economies seek to tackle inflation. Analysts forecast rates of 5% in the US, 3% in the Eurozone and somewhere between the two for the UK. Whilst low in historic terms, certainly if you're as old as I am, these rate increases are significant for the younger generation, who have only ever known mortgage rates with a one in front of them, followed by a dot. Some households may be faced with a three to four fold increase in monthly outgoings that will be hard to accommodate whatever changes they make to their lifestyles. The tools we have always used to fight inflation by taking capacity out of the market and thus forcing a price correction through demand changes may, after a period of soft monetary policy, which has allowed employment to reach capacity levels albeit at relatively low wage points, not work as it did in the past, when the medicine was delivered to a very different body. The dose may have to be somewhat higher and with far greater collateral damage to the fabric of society, creating a diversity of outcomes that are probably far greater than at any point since the end of the Second World War. How politicians, institutions and society navigate these chain challenges will undoubtedly influence the pace of recovery, as the deeper the divisions, the longer the time it will take for a fairer equilibrium to be restored. So why does this matter? 
Aside from the fact that we would all prefer to live in a society where we all share in prosperity, history tells us that fractured societies can lead to adversarial and extreme outcomes, distrust, and ultimately challenge to convention and institutions. Facing into the broader environmental and social challenges we encounter against such a background will make progress in achieving the UN sustainable goals even harder than they already are. As bankers, we are not politicians, but we do have a part to play in being responsible, being empathetic and seeking to build the foundations for a recovery. We need to learn responsibly in terms of risk and return, but to be seen to be making exceptional profits at a time when many are facing difficult choices over food and energy to pay their mortgages will do little for our reputation and more importantly, the sustainability of our business and role in society. It is far too easy to argue that rising profits are just a function of rising rates, when it's obvious that the spreads on loans and mortgages are increasing far more quickly than those on deposits. And whilst it's likely that more provisions will be required, it will be important to find the right triangulation between being socially responsible, looking after the best interests of customers, and rewarding shareholders who have seen returns below the cost of capital for many years. Some banks are getting that balance right, and others seem less able to do so which will only add to the voices in favour of additional taxation for the sector. Finding the right balance between lending sensibly and on an affordable basis, while showing compassion and consideration to borrowers in difficulties, helping them with interest rate concessions rather than penalties, and giving them time to pay is not an easy ask. Where do you draw the line between a customer just getting by and one in trouble, particularly when the concession you give to the customer in difficulty may mean three meals rather than two a day for the customer just getting by? Ironically, when loans are sold by major banks to the so-called vulture funds, these funds seem better able to provide a range of solutions that help the borrowers in those portfolios restore their finances. Challenging times call for innovative and groundbreaking solutions. So maybe it is time for a broader, a broader approach to helping customers across the spectrum, not just from the mainstream banks, but also from the regulators, who through a somewhat draconian approach to the treatment of non-performing loans, have contributed to the inflexibility that exists today. Which brings me back to, to what it means to be a responsible banker. Being a responsible banker is about understanding and balancing the needs of all stakeholders. Many commentators agree that banks were able to respond effectively to the restrictions placed on business and society by COVID, albeit without the option of digital banking and online communication, that would have been nigh on impossible. Regulation has undoubtedly created more banks for investors, but the jury is out as to whether there is really more choice for the consumer, be that an individual or business. And the cost of credit for those at the margin remains relatively high. And the number of businesses and individuals in that category will undoubtedly increase as inflation squeezes discretionary incomes. The future is as ever uncertain, but full of opportunities as well as challenges. Banks will need to evolve and change. Both regulation and society will expect banks to be more responsible in the way that they allocate capital and play a role in how society responds to the climate and housing challenges that lie ahead, not to mention the cyclical challenges of a potentially prolonged recession. Finding the right balance between providing support and good risk management is a tricky balance for any bank. Banks should lend shareholder capital and deposit money responsibly and sustainably, but they have perhaps been too one-dimensional in their assessment of through the cycle risk or the profile of a business or an individual relying too heavily on scorecards that drive optimal outcomes rather than some of the judgments that help individuals and businesses through many of the economic cycles of the past. And events over the past few years have taught us a lot about responsibility. Wherever in adapting to changes in how and where we work, how we serve our customers, the communities we operate in, and the wider needs of the society brought together whilst physically apart. That is why we want this conference to demonstrate the challenges of building sustainable and responsible banking models and what that means for banks, bankers, and society. We believe it is our institute's role to help our members understand how you can apply the principles for responsible banking in your work life, what tools you can use, and at a time when customer expectations demand to change in, we want to enable our members to develop the skills and knowledge to support their customers. Stewardship is the word our founders would have used almost 150 years ago. Today, we would interpret stewardship as being responsible and sustainable. And that is why we define a responsible banking banker as someone doing the right thing in the interest of society, the environment, and their customers. But in the light of current economic volatility, with energy and food costs rising dramatically, 
has the importance and urgency of enhancing sustainable banking and finance lessened? Certainly in the short term, it, has, it probably has. As many countries, countries battle with energy crises and having depleted their savings and reserves during the pandemic, many households and firms lack the buffers to cope with substantial increases in the cost of living, cost of production and the cost of servicing debt amidst a backdrop of rising inflation and rising interest rates, leaving them perhaps less able to pay the premium for a product that has been sustainably produced. But the impact of global warming on individuals, communities in our world will dwarf those of COVID and the current social economic challenges, which is why tackling, tackling the climate emergency has to remain a priority for policymakers and regulators globally. From a financial standpoint, central bankers continue to be increasingly concerned about climate risks. In recent years, especially the risks of a rapid transition, stranded assets, and their impact on financial stability. This should prompt, prompt action from financial institutions heavily exposed to high carbon assets and move towards reducing fossil fuel exposures in portfolios. And yet much of that progress has slowed this year. But making a real contribution to the challenges we have placed on our planet has to be more than just protecting a bank's balance sheet. For the transition to net zero to succeed, and to succeed by mid-century and keep the uplifting global warming to 1.5 degrees, we must act fast and make considerable progress as early as the end of this decade. In doing so, we clearly don't need all bankers to become deep sustainability experts, but every banker does need the tools to apply a sustainability lens to their professional practice. And this is where the PRB Academy can help, and that's what we'll hear about tomorrow. So I would argue sustainable finance is more important and mainstreaming sustainable banking and finance is more urgent than ever. Alongside the very significant commercial and investment opportunities for financial services that, that it provides, there is an even more compelling moral case. Sustainable banking and finance is an opportunity for our banking profession to demonstrate our positive social purpose. We can and we must play a leading role in helping individuals, communities, countries, and our planet transition to a sustainable, more socially just, low carbon world. As we look ahead, responsible banking needs to be led by professional bankers. And we need to ensure that the future of banking is one that reflects and celebrates the diversity of our world. We live in a global community and it's absolutely right that we look outwards and face into the challenges that arise from the current economic uncertainty and geopolitical events, as well as climate change. The roles that bankers can play in meeting these unprecedented challenges to our industry, but also to the world in which we and our families live, and these are areas that I'm sure we'll touch on on a few occasions throughout the course of the next two days. Tomorrow, we're delighted to have Simone Declin from UNEPFI join us to provide a keynote speech. And this will be followed by a discussion on why responsible banking values matter. But today's topic is responsible banking in a global inflationary, inflationary climate. So I'd like to thank you all for listening. And I'll now introduce a short video about a new, a new UK-based campaign called Make My Banking Matter before we move into the panel session. Hello everyone. My name is Hugh Davis and I've been invited to say a few words on the topic of responsible banking in relation to its role in climate change and nature restoration. I have a background in sustainable finance having been a member of the senior team at Triodos Bank in the UK for almost 10 years and I'm currently Senior Finance Advisor to a public campaign called Make My Money Matter. I hope my short piece of content here provides some interesting food for thought and perhaps a, a different angle. A few words firstly about the campaign. Make My Money Matter was co-founded by Richard Curtis, film director of Love Actually fame, a couple of years ago. And we want to give more voice and choice to people over their money and align finance to a sustainable future. We're primarily a public facing campaign using creative and educational content to boost awareness and action amongst the public. But we also run a successful strand of work focusing on businesses and their financial footprint, as well as engaging with the finance sector to encourage, challenge and hold to account. So far, we've focused on pensions, aiming to get as much of the three trillion pounds in UK pension schemes aligned to credible net zero targets and delivery against them. Such huge amounts of long term money has the potential to shape a sustainable future, but also the potential to drive destructive climate change and nature loss. 
and create a world that none of us would really choose to retire into. We produced several influential reports, including one showing that over £300 billion of pension fund investments are in companies and financial institutions with a high risk of driving deforestation. We've also raised awareness amongst the public, industry and government about the importance of how our pensions are invested. I could say a lot more about pensions, but given this event is the annual banking conference, I'll turn to banking. The vast majority of the UK public, of course, has a relationship with a bank, and usually it's one of the big high street names. Make My Money Matter will be launching a public campaign very soon, focusing on the largest UK high street banks, HSBC, Barclays, Santander, NatWest and Lloyds, and their financing of fossil fuel expansion. Because the fact is that our banks are continuing to provide billions in financing to fossil fuel companies. In fact, between 2016 and 2021, HSBC, Barclays, Santander, NatWest and Lloyds provided a collective $141 billion to the largest upstream oil and gas expanders. All this despite the fact that the International Energy Agency announced last year that there can be no investment in new oil and gas fields if we are to achieve net zero by 2050 and limit the rise in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees. To address the issues of expensive energy and energy security, we must focus on ramping up clean renewable energy and efficiency measures such as insulation rather than an expanding fossil fuels which lock us into carbon addiction for years to come, blow through our carbon budget and of course create stranded asset risks for the finance sector. That's why we're calling on our major high street banks to stop financing fossil fuel expansion. Firstly, by taking the step to stop the direct financing of any fossil fuel expansion activities, and then to serve notice to their clients that are involved in fossil fuel expansion activity that they will cease to provide any new finance to them unless they stop these activities. And as I record this film, it's brilliant to note that just yesterday, Lloyds Bank in the UK announced that it will not provide direct finance for new oil, gas and coal projects. Although there is much more to be done, this important symbolic first step from a major UK bank means that others should now follow. Because if they don't, then their customers will want to know why. Responsible finance also means how banks are portrayed through advertising. In a climate emergency, there can be no tolerance for greenwashing. So it was good again this week to see the UK Advertising Standards Regulator declare that two climate change adverts from HSBC are banned for being misleading about the company's work to tackle climate change. It upheld complaints that the adverts omitted significant information about HSBC's contribution to carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. There's clearly focus and momentum here. The finance sector, be it banks, pension funds or insurers, has a huge role to play in shaping our collective futures. And these institutions are run by people, of course, individuals such as all of you, people who I have no doubt share common concerns about the futures you and your families will experience as we see more and more evidence around the world of the impacts of climate change and nature destruction. So let me finish with an appeal to you all that as you go back to your jobs, whether you're a CEO or an intern, consider what you can do to create with others a bank that you can really be proud of. If you lead an organisation, show that bold vision that's now needed. If you are new to banking, make your voice heard in your company about the kind of bank you want it to be. This is the collective global challenge of our generation. Banks have a crucial role to play and you as bankers must deliver urgently because the public, your customers, will expect nothing less. Thank you and really hope that you enjoy the rest of the event. Wow, um, I think that video really demonstrates the uh, challenge that lies ahead, but also the commitment of the Chartered Banker Institute to being in the forefront of this debate, uh, however difficult and challenging being in the forefront is. Um, the figures within that um, video are from 2016 to 2021, and they're pretty staggering. However, you know, all of the UK high street banks who were mentioned in that video have signed up to the Net Zero Banking Alliance last year, 
So it will be interesting to see um, what happens to those lending figures. And, and clearly, as you heard in the video, Lloyds have taken a significant step towards you know, following up on the commitments that, they, that they've made. So um, I'd now like to hand over to Professor Aditya Singh, who's the director of the Athena School of Management in India, who's chairing today's panel discussion on responsible banking in a global inflationary climate. So Professor Singh, over to you. Thank you so much, Steve, uh, for, for, this, for this really, really important insight and setting the course of discussions over the next two days in this annual banking conference, and perhaps giving us certain goalposts and parameters to, to, to actually follow and to ponder over as we take this panel discussion forward today and tomorrow, and of course, the keynote focus too. Responsible banking has become a well-used term in recent times. We saw this particularly around the run-up to the United Nations Climate Change Conference or the COP26 in November last year. Now, a lot of banks and other FIs, what they call financial institutions, use the term, maybe as part of the organizational purpose or in context of the ESG strategy. Steve just alluded to in his opening remark that there is no official definition of responsible banking. But as he said, and I think we can all agree with this, a responsible banker is one that is clear on what is the right thing to do in interest of society, the environment, for their customers and all the stakeholders. The challenge is not to do the right thing when the going is easy. The challenge is to do the right thing when the going gets tough. And I think all of us can agree here, panelists and of course attendees, that the going has got tough in the past few months and if, if, if we are anything to guess, it's going to get tougher also. So that's where your responsibility as bankers really comes into play, isn't it? Over the next, well, slightly over 60 minutes or so, we will seek to expand on that thought in our discussions. And no doubt, you know, we will try to cite a lot of practical examples on responsible banking from across the world. At the conference last year, we discussed what responsible banking really means for organizations. Going a step further, this year's conference considers how responsible banking can support equality, diversity, reduce poverty, and other linked SDGs and where its current limitations are. How can we deal in a responsible and sustainable way with challenges, including inflation that is leading you know, all around the world? And yes, my dear friends, we do have challenges, isn't it? I mean, you have war in Europe to start off with, and that's not something which is going away very soon, unfortunately, it seems so. Global inflation, major economies in recession, a climate crisis, and now a food supply crisis to boot, supply chain issues. So it's like all the misfortunes have come together. But it is at this very moment that we have to come together as bankers, as financial institution specialists, and make sure that we can create change and impact in a long-term sustainable way. Because responsible banking is an extension of banking itself, isn't it? And it is part of this network and high, which includes sustainable finance, ESG investments, um, you know, SDGs, and has to make sure that it creates long-term benefit and impact for everyone. Of course, as Steve said, there may be some amount of short-term uh, uh, you know, effects on this, but that has to be taken as a bitter pill if we want to succeed forward. On that note, I have the pleasure of introducing an all-star, rock star panel from all across the world, uh, you know, global thought leaders in their fields, and let me begin with introducing the first panelist is Dr. Vian Sharif. Vian, of course, is the CEO of Nature Alpha and the head of sustainability at the FNZ Group. She is, of course, collaborating with academics at Cambridge and Oxford, being a product of them. She's part of the team driving development of innovative technology solutions to capitalize the shift to a more sustainable capital allocation and hopefully and ultimately a more sustainable world. Prior to this, she's been a global asset manager at Investic for a long time, so she really knows how both sides of the coin are. Our second panelist is Yasser Ansari. Yasser, of course, is CEO of FinAsia, who he joined recently in April 22. Before that, he was the chief executive of the Australian Investment Council, where he worked for leading the strategic direction of organizations in representing the private capital management industry and investment industry in Australia. He was, a pol he was in the policy and advocacy for chartered accountants Australia and New Zealand. And of course, he has more than two decades of experience in leading organizations in Australia. He holds, uh, is he of course by default is a chartered accountant, uh, no surprises over there Yasser. And of course he holds a Bachelor of Commerce from the Australian National University and a Master of Taxation Law from the University of New South Wales. He was of course also appointed by the federal government in 2016 
to the Medical Research Future Fund Advisory Board, where he advises on strategy and priorities for medical health research funding from a $20 billion fund. Our last but definitely not the least, our final panelist on the board of here today is Ekwan Moknasi Mohammed, who is the CEO of Am Islamic Bank Barhad. Ekwan joined them in 2015 as CEO. He has also been the group sustainability champion of Am Bank Group since 2019. He commenced his career, of course, with Price Waterhouse Coopers in the London office, and then he subsequently joined the corporate advisory practice in Kuala Lumpur. He has decades of experience across corporate banking, debts, corporate finance, real estate management, m and so and so forth. Very importantly, he received the award of the Islamic Banker of the Year 2019 and CEO of the Year 2021 from the Global Islamic Finance Awards. And he has been named as the best Islamic banking CEO in Malaysia for three consecutive years from 2019 to 2021 and also banking CEO of the Year in Malaysia in 2020. Ikwan, hopefully you can make it, you know, a four years in a row and we see you in 2022 and perhaps 2023 also as that on that. On that note, before we start the formal discussion, I'm going to throw a question as a poll to the audience. Heather, request your help in that. The question is, do you discuss the impact of climate change on your business within your organization? You can only take one choice, no multiple choice questions over here. Do you discuss the impact of climate change on your business within your organization? We will give you just a few more seconds because time and tide wait for no man or woman. Please do vote, and we'd love to see what what the poll you know come in shows us after that. All right, and here are the results. Most of your organizations discuss climate change occasionally or increasingly. Now, you know, those are pretty wide parameters. So 12% say never, 35% say occasionally, 37% say increasingly, and 17% say regularly. I'm sure the percentage of increasing and occasionally has increased over the past couple of years as compared to before, and that's a good sign. We hope to see more of this movement regularly as we move forward in the next couple of years. You know, ladies and gentlemen, when we got this panel discussion topic a few months ago, it was almost prescient because the topic is responsible banking in a global inflationary climate. And I think that's become a very, very major issue for all of us in the banking and the financial services industry over the past few months. And this is going to be one of our major problems as bankers and also perhaps in government. So let's start this panel discussion. I must alert you that if you have any further questions, please do share it with us in the Q&A tab. And hopefully if we have some time remaining, which we're trying to keep in the final 10 minutes, we'll try to answer some of them, whichever one which we can. But let me start off this discussion by asking the first very important question to this panel, all right? And I'd like to ask each of you to give a summary of what responsible banking means to you and who needs to learn about responsible banking. And what I mean by that is, is this something which only training specialists within banks or banking have to learn, or is this for everyone? All right. Vian, would you like to start off with this, please? <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. It, it's a real privilege, first of all, to be with you all today and with such a distinguished chair and uh, panelist uh, lineup. So thank you so much for this. And also very, very inspirational to see how the topic of responsibility in banking is being handled. And really my quick response would be that we're seeing both in investment, in wealth management and in financial advice, a new focus from the regulator on sustainability and responsible investment. And so what I'd say is over the course of the last 10 years, whilst this topic has been rather a niche topic or a side topic, it's actually coming to the fore for all of these individuals practicing and working in the area of finance. And so my view is that this isn't 
a small side topic anymore. This is actually a whole new area of understanding. It's very multifaceted. We touched in the introduction on many, many points around what responsibility means here. It's not just about responsibility in terms of impact on the environment or nature, which is my area of expertise, but also the social implications of how we lend and what we're financing with everyday money. If we think that some half of all capital allocations or investments, half of the $120 trillion worth of assets under management are managed on behalf of median income households, then having those households understand where their money is going and what they're financing is crucial. But we're just at the start of this. And my view is that this area is going to become as deep and as large as something like tax planning. This is going to become central as a theme for all people in finance to understand. Thank you, Vin. Yasser, why don't you go next here yeah, with your summary? Um, thank you, and, and thanks, uh, uh, Professor, and, and thanks, Vian. Uh, like you, um, fantastic to be with you all um, today. It's uh, the evening here in, in Australia, so forgive me if I uh, refer to... Uh, refer to that a couple of times. Um, look, on, on this point, um, Professor, I think that um, there is absolutely no question, no question at all in my mind that this is a topic, a conversation, an area of focus uh, and learning that pervades the entire banking sector and arguably pervades the entire financial services ecosystem, as we've heard a little bit earlier already in this panel discussion. Um, I think the, the observation that I think is most profound and perhaps most pertinent, Professor, on this one is that the past two or three years of us enduring what has been a catastrophic and very devastating global pandemic um, on a public health level as well as at a, an economic level uh, for just about every nation around the world has in many respects created a very significant acceleration in the focus uh, that has been directed towards responsible investment, responsible banking practices and sustainability conversations. And I think it ties in very neatly uh, in my view with the points that Vian uh, just eloquently spoke to. And that is that the, the, the conversation has evolved markedly in recent times and will continue to evolve and accelerate over the coming years. And I agree entirely with that. Um, but Professor, for me, I think in many respects, the pandemic actually is responsible for causing all of us. It doesn't matter what sector you operate in, it doesn't matter what your role, in as you, uh, role is, as you say, whether you're the CEO, whether you're uh, a middle manager, whether you're at the front line working with customers uh, or the community. It has caused all of us to stop and think about the important role that we play in impacting the lives of others and how profound that impact might be um, if we make decisions uh, that direct our uh, community or our society towards outcomes that are either favourable or unfavourable. And I think it's heightened awareness for all of us because of that. So for me, the answer to your question at the outset is this is not something that resides within the training team of a bank. It's not something that resides within a small group of individuals who need to be subject matter experts. This is something that is all pervasive and it must be ingrained within the ecosystem of financial services right across the spectrum from banking right through to other corners of the sector as well. Thank you, Yasser. Ekwan, you of course are leading a bank. So we'd love to have your idea and input on this for sure. Yeah, thank you, Professor Singh. Um, so um, I'm in Kuala Lumpur, so good afternoon uh, to everybody. Can I firstly express uh, my appreciation to the organizers for inviting me to share some thoughts on the topic? And I'm also feeling very privileged and honored to be um, together with a, a set of distinguished panelists to discuss this topic today. Um, by way of introduction, um, I'm from uh, MBank Islamic, which is Islamic banking arm of MBank Group, uh, one of the uh, Universal Financial Services Institution in Malaysia. Um, so going back to the question on what uh, we define responsible banking to be, I will simply um, put it to be where we conduct our business uh, to ensure that over the long term, we do consider the interests and needs of all our stakeholders. If I can bring you to uh, the 
I guess, sustainability framework of M Bank Group. We have uh, a sustainability framework, and our framework is actually underpinned by the principles of ESG, which in turn comprises three pillars: being responsible banking, uh, conscious self conduct, and positive societal impact. So, in essence, when we speak about our business, how we attempt to conduct our business in a responsible fashion, it's about looking at customer satisfaction. Uh, we look at mitigating ESG and climate-related risks. Uh, specifically, in Ambank, for example, we have what we call an exclusion list, where we now no longer provide new or additional financing for coal or coal-related activities, or where it impacts society adversely, where businesses involve child labor or forced labor. Our credit process, we now also overlay our credit assessment uh, together with ESG risk rate and climate risk. And of course, we look at expanding the offering of our green products. And uh, last but not least is about financial inclusion and providing access to financing, particularly to the underserved and unserved. So in terms of the definition, um, in short, it's about how we conduct our business by considering the interests and needs of all stakeholders, not only the shareholders. Um, we have a framework which governs how we move forward to achieve our aspiration. And specifically um, to your other question uh, in relation to who should this knowledge be permitted to. Um, so for us, it's important uh, that everybody within the organization, it's not confined to any specialized area. So whether you are a frontliner, sales team, a relationship manager, our risk managers, the finance department, operations, IT technology, uh, what we've done is as a start, everybody needs to go through an online classroom session, we call it Sustainability 101, which encompasses the element of responsible lending. And of course, some of the specialist areas, uh, we will equip them with the appropriate skills so that they are able to also fulfill our role to, and ambition to become a responsible bank. Now, this is important because um, it, we generally believe there is a real business impact on ESG risk and opportunities, uh, no doubt, there are also some drive from regulators, especially skewed towards climate risk. And um, of course, last but not least, when we speak to say our investors, there's also a demand for it. And even some new um, employees, like the millennials, when they look at joining MBank, for example, questions revolving, do you have an ESG agenda? Um, do you only look at profit as your primary motivation? So these are vital factors for us to not only attract customers, not only to attract investors and retain them, but equally important to retain and to attract talent as well. So I hope that gives a color from the perspective of at least MBank Group or how we define responsible banking and why we feel it's important to actually permeate this knowledge throughout the organization. So I'll pass back to you, Professor Singh. Thank you, Ekwan. And, and, and the drift, as they say, that I'm getting from this panel is that responsible banking is not the purview of a particular department or vertical. It has to be, and it is a core imperative, you know, for every single person in the banking and the financial services sector. It's everybody's concern. It's everybody's baby. So if you don't look after your baby, who will? As simple as that. And on that note, my next question is to Yasser. And this is Yasser, how do you envisage the interplay between responsible banking and the sustainable development goals, the UN SDGs, which have become in many ways uh, the 10 or now, of course, the 17 commandments for all of us in the sustainability sector. How can responsible yeah. banking support equality, diversity, reduce poverty, and all the other issues which we now see being linked to the SDGs? Well, in, in my mind, uh, Professor Singh, I think there's um, clearly uh, an interplay between uh, those two um, responsibilities and those goals. Um, I, I think it's very clear that the role that financial institutions play is a very profound one. Um, and again, we're not talking exclusively about the banking sector, but we can interpret for the purposes of this conversation, um, this as applying both to banking as well as to non-banking institutions across financial services. Um, but it is absolutely clear that the role that institutions play in the marketplace, the role uh, that they play in decision making and guiding the decision making, not just that they make within their own organisation about who they might lend money to or who they might financially provide project financing uh, to support, 
Uh, those decisions are the obvious ones, uh, and they go very much to the themes that we heard a little bit more about um, in the earlier videos. Um, but what's really important here is to understand the interplay, the connection, if you like, between um, the indirect influence, the indirect role that financial institutions like banks can play in the marketplace. We heard a little bit from uh, Iqbal already about um, the role that um, his organization is playing in that context. And I think this is where, Professor Singh, there is absolutely an opportunity for institutions to have um, a very clear connection and a sense of responsibility in many respects. If, if we ask ourselves uh, a question to challenge our own thinking on this one, the question might be, if financial institutions like banks, like pension funds, um, other corners of the financial ecosystem, um, if we don't play this role in helping to realize um, progress towards achieving um, those significant milestones around sustainable development goals, who will? Who will, who, will, who will shoulder the responsibility if financial services institutions do not? Governments certainly can't play the complete role that perhaps the community might expect them to play. We know that governments all over the world are challenged to fund and to provide funding and financial support to all of the community's expectations. So there is a very obvious gap here and that gap must be fulfilled by the financial services sector in my view. Ultimately, it's about alignment. And again, we've already heard a little bit about this from uh, the conversation in this panel so far, Professor Singh, but it's about aligning um, the responsibilities, the objectives, both to shareholders as well as to customers and to broader society in terms of a license to operate within our communities. The alignment between institutions and the sustainable development goals is a very important one. And I think what can be observed, certainly true here in the Australian market, um, uh, in, in, my, in, in my experience, is there is now a much greater recognition and even a much greater focus on reporting against milestones in respect of sustainable development goals across financial institutions. It's now almost, I, I, I use the word almost quite deliberately here, but it's almost common practice. There is still more work to do, of course, and there will probably be more work to do for many years, but um, it is now almost common practice here in this market um, to, um, to identify financial institutions through their reporting mechanisms, both public facing and otherwise, their alignment to the SDGs. And I think that's a significant advancement on where we've been over the past few years. Um, a couple of other points, just briefly. Um, I, I think it's also very clear from what is happening and what's playing out in front of us right now, that there is a a burning platform for a lot of financial institutions around ensuring that they can not only adopt practices and evolve their practices to ensure that they are customer centric in every possible way uh, they can be, but it is also becoming more and more clear and more urgent for financial institutions to offer to their workforce, to their talent, as Equan uh, touched on a little bit earlier a very compelling value proposition for them to both stay within the organization and to join the organization. And so I think, again, the, the confluence of circumstances that are playing out economically, particularly in respect of a tight global labor market, uh, a war for talent, as some people refer to it here in Australia, at least, um, offering a very compelling employee value proposition to your people um, is just as important as anything else at the moment. And perhaps that wasn't always the case a few years ago. Um, I, I, I'm happy to leave my comments there, Professor Singh, but I think there is, um, that there is a considerable amount to traverse in a conversation around this connection, this interplay. Uh, but for me, it's a very compelling one and a very clear and direct one. Thanks, Yasser. And I think all of us hear you clearly. You know, I, I happen to chair um, uh, the Global Business Schools Network's uh, chair of uh, you know sustainable finance and ESG investment, which are about 200 top business schools across the world. And the one thing we keep telling people across the world is the financial sector, and that includes banking, of course, has to be the vanguard of change. What the financial sector does, what global finance does, what, what banking does is what's going to actually truly impact change from a sustainability, circularity, and ESG perspective. 
So I, we, we completely get where you're coming from on that. But let me just go to the other side of the coin now. And I put this question again to Ekwan. What are the current limitations with supporting SDGs that you see from a responsible banking perspective? Okay, so uh, thank you, Professor, for the um, question. Um, I just want to set at the uh, onset that um, in Ambang Group, um, we do look at the UN SDGs. Um, in fact, uh, we believe that we support 10 out of 17 um, UN uh, SDGs and we'll continue to support them. Um, so amongst uh, others, um, the climate change, um, SDG, uh, and also where it touches uh, in the area of deploying funding and credit is where banks can actually play the role to support the um, SDGs. Um, if, if we are also uh, guided by the uh, six principles of the United Nations uh, Environmental Program for Financial Institution, the principles of responsible banking. Um, so, you know, I wish to echo what uh, Yase has mentioned uh, in relation to the aspect of alignment. So our first principle, for example, is about aligning our business strategies to be consistent <clears throat> with, amongst others, the SDG or the Paris uh, Climate Agreement and what have you. Um, however, uh, as much as you know, banks can play a role to support the SDGs, some of um, our abilities to support them can be somewhat limited. Now, when we actually dive into the 169 targets and 230 plus indicators, the 17 SDGs, but there's like hundreds of targets and indicators. Um, they, I would say, uh, revolve around the area of poverty eradication and also public institutions. So perhaps some of the targets or indicators are actually more appropriate for public institutions or government. So may not be exactly banks. Um, and these SDGs um, <clears throat> may not also be appropriate for the more advanced economy. So to give you one example, um, it's about you know, providing access to mobile telephones for women. So when you take a step back for a financial institution, such a target or indicator may not be that um, relevant. Uh, secondly, there are a number of targets um, which were actually meant for the year 2020, we're now in 2022. Um, so perhaps um, you know, the SDG setters can revisit some of the targets to make it more current. Uh, and then one thing that you know, I think this is quite uh, prevalent in the developing nations is some of the contradicting goals, specifically, uh, there are goals on uh, poverty eradication and also climate change. Now, of course, we do recognize that uh, climate change is real, but the global economy need to recognize the intricate peculiarities of certain low-income nations or jurisdictions. So classic case is in poorer nations, for example, whilst there is a recognition to manage the increase in global temperature, but simply put, some societies simply need to clear the land um, and actually you know, plant basic uh, crop for their own survival. And we also hear some of the uh, complaints about you no know, commitments uh, not being honored uh, because it may be uh, difficult for certain economies or jurisdictions or countries which are at a certain stage of their lives where they need to survive today. So henceforth, even though we do recognize that climate change is real, is one of the 17 SDG. Uh, at the same time, if we were to seek to meet other SDGs pertaining to, say, um, uh, poverty eradication, it may somewhat be oxymoronic to climate change management. Yeah, so, but notwithstanding some of these uh, limitations, which uh, may not only be applicable to financial institutions, but some economists may have a challenge to balance the uh, competing needs of the SDGs, it is still a very useful and universal guide. And as far as possible, I think uh, financial institutions like MBank will continue to support the SDG as best as we can. And I think it's a question of all stakeholders playing the role to resolve these anomalies, to find the common goal. So I think I'll pause there and pass back to you, Professor. Thank you, Ekwan. Uh, so how do we actually deal you know, with these limitations in a responsible and sustainable way. And Vian, if, if you could just, you know, guide us a bit on that, it would be great to hear your perspective on that. Uh, Professor Singh, how do we deal with the 
with the limitations, perhaps by looking at what the opportunity is. And I think that if we look at the environment in which we operate today, there is an increased focus on the mainstreaming of sustainability uh, considerations into how we do business. So notwithstanding the fact that into in every uh, most companies uh, legal articles were set up for the benefit of shareholders, what we're finding more uh, often is a focus on how uh, lending is done or how investment is made or how deals are done with a consideration on other lenses which might pose a risk or might pr propose an opportunity for that financial activity when it comes to environmental, societal or governance considerations. I'll give you an example. First of all, we have broad awareness amongst consumers that they want to understand the impact of their investments or their financial situation. There's a greater awareness in the world around us, whether that be direct effects that you and I are experiencing. And what I love about this panel is the diversity of global representation. It's it's brilliant. It's, it's something I don't see very often, but we have to remember that uh, sustainability means different things to different people in different ways, wherever they may be. And there are absolutely very real considerations in different parts of the world around what sustainability and responsibility means to the individual. But nevertheless, there is a global understanding. The second point is that the regulator around the world is taking note. So you're seeing an unprecedented swathe of regulation come in around these considerations, which means that from a global investment community through to financial institutions, through to TCFD, through to the, the nascent task force for nature related disclosures, the EU taxonomy, which requires the reporting of very detailed sustainability KPIs, the regulation is, is, is forting the dialogue around these issues. So mainstreaming this consideration is very, uh, very important and will have, in my view, a very big impact. The final thing to say is that we have the technology available to see and monitor things that were just not visible 10 years ago. The amount of data we have at our fingertips to start mainstreaming this information into everyday decision making from a finance perspective means that it can be collated and provide a new lens on financial decision making wherever that may be. And that is why I think now is different and why we can make a change, whereas perhaps before it might have been more challenging. Thanks, Leon. And, and stay with me because I just like to segue a bit, you know, more into, you know, how, you know, uh, responsible banking can actually aid, you know, biodiversity and nature. And so my, my next question to you, Leon, is what's the role of responsible banking in protecting and restoring nature and biodiversity? But it's become such a major, major, major issue in the past few years, and it will be more and more in the years to come. 100% Professor Singh. Uh, when I started my PhD looking at environmental behavior change in the area of nature, you know, it really was a philanthropic activity where we were looking at how you channel philanthropic funding into preserving some of the world's most precious biodiversity. But now it's, it's an emergent and very large wave that's coming in around the necessity for financial institutions to understand their impact on biodiversity and nature. Partly because if we look at the world around us, everything is, is founded on the, the ecosystem services, the, the wood, the air, the soil where we plant our crops, everything is based on the natural environment which has not yet been considered in how we make financial decisions. So what we're starting to see is, again, coming back to this role of technology, it is now astonishing the level of detail that it's possible to see in terms of how uh, financial institutions are allocating their capital in terms of the impact that's having on the world. I'll give you an example. We were asked to help um, explore deforestation concerns in a very large uh, multinational company. We were able to pinpoint the suppliers that were uh, problematic. We were able to understand the locations of those suppliers in incredibly important and protected intact forests and ecosystems, which we've agreed that we're not going to decimate those areas. So, you know, that's agreed. 
we could actually see using satellite imagery the deforestation footprint that the swathe of trees that had actually encroached upon the intact forests um, and we were able to give that information back to the asset manager who was then able to vote against the board of that company so there there is so much uh opportunity and transparency here but also to highlight it it, we have to um, be responsible about how we use this information, um, but equally, this new visibility, this radical transparency is not going away. It's only going to advance, in, in my opinion. So there's a huge opportunity here to start to shift and shape practices in a responsible way, taking into account all the considerations that my fellow panelists have shared with us. Thanks, Vian. And let's do a bit of a deep dive. I'm not going to let you get away so easily. So, you know, you've told us about <laughs> bankers trying to make decisions about nature. So let, 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 let me put it to you. What is the advice you would give to them, to bankers, about taking nature into the decision making on the day-to-day -day roles? Because it could be something which could be very long-term with a very short-term, you know, deliverable as of now. So how do they actually balance both of them and not be caught between the devil and the deep sea? Uh, it's a great question because there's, there's, you know, I think this has been part of the challenge. No, no one expects a banker to wake up in the morning thinking about biodiversity. You know, they're thinking about how they're allocating capital efficiently, responsibly, and the different risks to that capital. After all, even the asset management community is here because we're investing on behalf of our, uh, of our underlying investors for usually the goals they want to achieve in life, a dignified retirement, this is crucial. So I would say in this space, bankers can refer to things like the Task Force for Nature Related Disclosures, which look at what natural capital is and how there are material risks there to investment decisions and lending decisions, just like climate in both the short term in terms of physical uh, risks, but the longer term in terms of transition planning, Nature is exactly the same. I'll give you another example. If I'm um, looking at lending to a beer company and the beer company, this is happening in Mexico, the, the aquifers no longer serve the ability to provide the water needed for that company to provide to make beer. So they have to move the plant. You know, these are significant material risks that are very location specific in relation to ecosystem services, which we're going to have to start to understand, but we can understand using the technology available, whether it's any of the tools that we're developing or the other data that's available, it's going to start to come together to be able to shine a light for bankers on the risks and opportunities that are being uh, being surfaced when it comes to natural capital decisions. And then what I really take away from you is, is that one of the final words that you mentioned, it's not only risks, it's also opportunities. And that's something I think as bankers, we wanted to realize, uh, you know, going green, becoming environment friendly, following ESG protocols, being responsible does not mean you know, all the time taking a hit on revenue and profits can actually be very profitable too if you follow the strategies in a proper way. Sometimes they may not, and that's just doing the right thing. But many a time, there are phenomenal long-term and mid-term opportunities out there if we integrate all of this into our operating structures and long-term strategy. And ESG is no more a social imperative, isn't it? It's a pure, pure business imperative now and no business can survive long-term as a conglomerate, as a large operation, without integrating ESG thought into its strategy and processes. Um, and, and thanks for that, Vian. It actually gives us a lot of insight. But I'll move to some another aspect now. And Ekwan, I want you to help me with this. Do you think the rising inflationary environment, and, and I think we can all agree, inflation is rising everywhere. I wish it wasn't, but it's rising in every single economy in the world right now. Does it possess a challenge? to sustainability, particularly from a retail and commercial banking perspective, where you have so many different pressures from a regulatory, regulatory macro, micro perspective? Well, Professor, uh, it's a very uh, challenging question, but the answer is actually um, simple. The answer is definitely and absolutely. 
Uh, firstly, I think let's just uh, take a step back to understand the impact of inflation to you know, banks, um, regardless of the jurisdictions, for retail and SME customers. So obviously, you know, inflation simply means um, you know, prices going up. Um, so there's actually impact to revenue of our customers um, because the demand for their own sales have been adversely impacted. Uh, more profoundly is the higher cost. So it begs the question to what extent that our customers can in turn pass the cost increase to their own customers. And if they do, then it might squeeze the demand. If they don't, then it's going to squeeze their margin. From a uh, financial services sector perspective, so you have seen how the US Fed uh, Reserve has increased interest rates significantly. So I think the other central banks, uh, whether in Malaysia and the UK, are followed suit in Australia as well. Um, so the impact is quite phenomenal. For customers, be it retail or commercial, they need to inevitably pay higher installment amounts to the banks. And inflation has actually, as I mentioned, caused higher raw material costs. So for example, a customer that has a certain amount of facilities, and because the raw material costs have actually gone up, they need to come to us to request for additional facilities because the costs have simply come up. So the cost impact is significant, the demand impact is significant, the extent of impacting their installment to us, to banks, have, are also quite significant. Now, the matter has been exacerbated by, um, you know, of course, COVID was one of the bigger culprits and the recent, unfortunately, you know, incident in Russia and Ukraine. And we hope that, you know, there's also China and Taiwan. And inevitably, because of these pressures, the discussion on sustainability or climate change is taking a step back, simply because the strategy of some of our commercial customers or the thinking of our retail customers Sustainability is taking a backseat. So they are rethinking their priority. What are the priorities? It's about cutting costs. So when you speak about costs, a number of organizations, say SMEs, the bulk of the cost is really uh, in terms of the employee costs. So when they need to cut costs, it may lead to either reduction in pay, reduction in overtime, reduction in working hours, or worse still, leading to redundancies. And it can also either willfully or, or uh, inadvertently lead to an unfair treatment of employees, so which is not a sustainable practice. And the current focus is about generating cash for the operations. And where some of our say, commercial banking customers were thinking about spending money to transition towards low carbon activities, they might think that whatever banking facilities that they have, it's about repivoting it towards survival, about working capital, rather than, for example, as a factory to purchase, say, solar panels or better machines. And, you know, it boils down to this uh, basic matter, and I think you mentioned it, Professor Singh, when we speak of sustainability or climate change or being responsible, it is not about not making money, because when profits are down, how is it that you can invest for profit, profit, uh, sustainability? Um, so inflation is, unfortunately, a uh, big evil uh, which has adversely impacted the real economy. So consequently, those who were thinking of embarking towards a, on a journey towards sustainability is taking a step back. Uh, those who never thought about migrating towards sustainability won't even start. So it's a serious problem for both our retail and commercial uh, customers and businesses. Thank you, Ekwan, for that insight. But Yasha, let me just take this a bit forward. And I want to ask you, he's, you know, Ikwan has shared us from a banking perspective, but how do we deal with this, you know, challenges that inflation is leading to around the world from a responsible and sustainable perspective in a way? Because it's not easy, is it? No, most certainly not. It's, uh, it's, it's a vexing problem, Professor Singh, um, for just about every country at the moment. Uh, if I speak a little bit about what's happening here in the Australian context, we have um, a, a very challenging environment where there are in, in, in substance a number of economic uh, drivers that are pushing and pulling the economy in opposing directions in some areas. Um, it is also creating um, a very significant and profound degree of uncertainty and instability in uh, forward planning. 
Um, and of course, we all know uh, on this panel, as well as all of our participants uh, today who are joining us, um, the extent to which um, a lack of clarity, a lack of certainty, uh, to the extent that it's reasonable, um, the impact of that on decision making, not just for banks, but for all financial intermediaries right across the ecosystem. Um, if we think a little bit, though, about the way that the banking sector can play um, a role, Professor Singh, to your question um, around being responsible and acting in a way that is consistent with sustainable practices. Let's think about the role that retail banks play in the marketplace in the current context. Um, what's happening here in the Australian market and what's really apparent in the past few months that inflation has become more of a, uh, an everyday conversation topic than um, it ever has been in times past, that's for sure, um, for everyone across the community. But what is clear is that banks are responding for the most part for the most part, by being very proactive in uh, the context of supporting uh, their customers. And I think that's tremendously important. And it's a very positive reflection, I think, of the experience, again, in my view, the experience that has come from the COVID uh, pandemic for our financial institutions. I think the pandemic has given them uh, not just the renewed focus on responsible investment and sustainable investment practices, uh, that I spoke about earlier, but it's also given them a window into the way in which they can play a proactive role in supporting community and society. Um, what I can observe here in the Australian market is that banks are responding to the pressure of the inflationary environment um, in a retail banking context, at least by supporting their customers through delivering more education about what it means to be financially um, well, um, and financial well-being is now a part of a very prominent marketing campaign for one of our largest uh, banks here in Australia. Financial well-being and the importance of well-being financially is something now that is hitting TV screens um, right in front of audiences right across the marketplace, those who are in the younger demographic uh, as well as those who are more mature. Um, providing budgeting tools is something that I can see prevalent here in the Australian market as well. Banks are delivering support from a very practical viewpoint in ways like that. Um, they're helping their customers to understand how they might be able to refill their savings balances because we know that the pressure of the inflationary environment um, is, as Equan uh, just spoke to a couple of moments ago, has put more pressure on businesses as well as retail uh, customers as well. So restocking uh, savings is something that um, is now more prominent. Thinking about very practical things also like how banks can play a role in encouraging their customers to consolidate debt, how they can play a role in delivering um, credit card uh, consolidation, interest-free periods for card transfers, all of those types of strategies that we know um, are prominent at different points in the economic cycle and now being leveraged by financial institutions to help solve um, in some ways the inflationary challenge. Um, so I think there is evidence now to support um, that the level of activity, the level of proactivity on the part of banks in particular, Professor Singh, um, is very prominent. And certainly in the conversations I have with government, the expectations of government and society at large are that financial institutions will take uh, a proactive role and take a leadership role in playing an important role to the extent that it is reasonable and appropriate for them to do that. Thanks, Yasser. And you know, just want to interlude here with, with how it's very interesting for us to understand that different jurisdictions, different countries are dealing with this problem in different ways. Uh, you see a lot of countries in the global south, for example, where inflation may be an issue, but recession is not an issue. For example, a country like India, which is which is uh, forecasted to be the fastest growing economy in the world for the next two years by the IMF stroke World Bank thing, stroke every single person you meet, which is nice for us. But what that means is that even though the basis points of int and interest rates have increased, you actually see increased spending from the consumer in the market. 
So in that case, perhaps the kind of strategy that you have to follow from a sustainable perspective may be very different from what you would see in a market which is both recessionary and inflationary at the same time. And I think that, you know, taking a cue from what Vian said earlier, we have to understand that different jurisdictions, different countries are going to address problems in different ways, because in the end, it, it, it's a huge world that we live in, and, and there have to be different strokes or different folks in the end. Now, Absolutely. taking that forward, you know, Yasser, I, I really wanted to, you know, ask you, what are the implications of all of these issues that we've been discussing so far for the education, training, and development of bankers? Well, look, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a very important conversation, this one, and I know that the work that the Charter Banking Institute does, uh, not just in the UK market context, but globally, uh, the work that they are doing at the moment with the United Nations is hugely important um, to our collective efforts as an ecosystem across financial services, uh, Professor Singh. And I think it's absolutely vital um, for the financial services industry to not only understand the important role that uh, we all play, as we've been speaking about uh, during the context of this panel discussion, um, but also understanding how communities' expectations have evolved. You know, for me, if I go right back to the start of the panel discussion, Professor Singh, about what responsible um, uh, banking means. I think responsible banking today means the same thing that it meant 30 years ago. What's changed today is society's context, the environment in which responsible practices um, need to play out has evolved. But the framework within which uh, everyone across the banking sector, everyone across the broader financial services sector needs to operate has not moved. We must act eth ethically, we must act with integrity, we must act in a way uh, that ensures we do no harm, that we support our customers, we support those with whom uh, we have uh, a stakeholder relationship in a way that's appropriate um, and consistent. And, and I think for me, the role of education, the role of training and development is absolutely central because in this context, it's less about um, building knowledge from the ground up. It's more about understanding the change in context, the change in environment that is played out and society's expectations. For me, that's the really pertinent issue here. And I think there is an element of work uh, clearly that needs to be done, certainly true of the Australian market. And I'm sure it's true of other jurisdictions around the world, Professor Singh, where we need to retrofit knowledge across uh, a, a large cohort of those in the professional banking community who haven't grown up with um, a set of expectations and an alignment to those expectations in a way that perhaps anyone who's 30 years or less might have. And I think that's a reality that we need to accept. And that's why the work that the CBI does, the work that we do here in the Australian market in partnering with CBI, I think is really important. And there's a long journey ahead of us to continue um, to deliver that knowledge, to deliver that support and to deliver that retrofitting as I describe it um, to the marketplace here in Australia. Thank you, Yasser. And I think I, I, I'll take a leap from what you just said. We have to understand half or almost half of the world's population now is below the age of 30. So context is very, very important. Uh, things which perhaps Many of us, when we were growing up, didn't think were important as it came to responsibility, sustainability, SDG, ESG is now a critical part of the thought process. It's intrinsic to many of them. And I think that, that puts context that you just cannot avoid going down this path anymore. You have to be able to go down this path and be responsible. And on that note, you know, Perfect. compared to last year's COP20, sorry. I was just going yeah. to make a comment in re response to that because it... it sure. So um, it's such an important point. And when we we when any leader sits in a boardroom, it's so often that you don't have the voice of the under 30s represented. And the disconnect between the perspectives is is something that we're all learning. It it has to, just as we have a diverse range of views here globally, we have to also ensure that the voice of those under 30s is reflected in leadership decision making. It's absolutely crucial, in my opinion. Couldn't agree more with you. And as a professor, I can tell you the sheer diversity uh, of views that I come across, you know, I teach across the world is phenomenal. 
It's phenomenal. And, and perhaps, you know, and perhaps a bit naively being an academic center, I think if only the world leaders could just sit down and listen to the ideas, inputs, insights with the below 30s have, I think we'd, 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 we'd have solved half the world's problems by now. Right. On that note, however, you know, the world is changing, right? I mean, last November we had the COP26. The world, you know, we, we got this entire reporting into place. We thought, oh, things are going to go well. And now look where we are. All right. You have a war in Ukraine. You have, because of that, an energy crisis, a food shortage crisis, which a lot of our friends in the global north may not realize, but it is going to have a very, very severe effect on the global south in the next. So while you may have an energy crisis in Europe, you actually are facing a global food crisis very, very shortly coming up in the developing world. Uh, you know, semiconductors, for example, supply chain issues are coming up over here. And of course, in the UK, tongue firmly in cheek, you've gone through three prime ministers, four chancellors, and scores of ministers in the past month. So who knows what's coming next over there? You know, and therefore there is a cost of living crisis. What does it mean? Does it mean we need to take a different view on sustainability and ESG? And are you and your colleagues finding these conversations with your customers? your clients, your stakeholders changing as a result of these very important geopolitic, and if I may add, geoeconomic developments. And uh, Ekwan, I'd love for you to lead on this. Thanks, uh, Professor Singh. Um, let me break that question into two parts. Uh, the first one is, um, do we need to adopt a different view on ESG sustainability? Uh, in my opinion, these two matters, the ESG, I guess biodefficient should be looked at um, as a long-term goal or aspiration. So henceforth, to my mind, any long-term aspiration should not change. So the short answer is no. Having said that, like any long-term strategy or aspiration, there needs to be a constant recalibration along the way. So when I refer to sustainability, it is about our ability to sustain our existence over the long term you know, by taking into consideration, as I mentioned, the interests and so the needs of all stakeholders. Having said that, we also need to survive today without losing sight of our long-term journey. So food shortages, energy uh, prices, uh, you know, the increase, cost of living crisis, they are real. And we mustn't ignore them, and we can't ignore them, but we must not lose sight of our long-term journey. So one of the things that I think we should look at is, you know, in the financial services sector, for example, the focus is very much skewed towards climate change, which I would say to be part of, you know, a subset of the environmental pillar of the ESNG. So perhaps the more profound uh, priority today would be to skew the conversation and the focus to recalibrate towards the S pillar, the uh, social society and as well, you know, the people dimension. Because the cost of living pressures and inevitably it will lead to, you know, maybe um, unfair treatment of employees is real. So rather than completely discarding or taking a different view of sustainability ESG, I think it should, we should remain steadfast. It's a long-term strategy, but it's a question of repivoting the priorities to the S pillar about the people. Now, the second chunk of your you know, comment and question is uh, whether the, the conversations that are actually taking place with customers and clients, you know, geopolitical developments, uh, what geoeconomic developments. Simple answer is yes. Um, the current focus is very much about survival. Um, you would remember, obviously, that we've just come out of COVID. So when we speak to our customers, when we start talking to them about sustainability, they will say that, you know, Ikwan, I need to survive today. My priority is about cash flow. So, you know, back to I guess, the earlier question, uh, it's about, put, unfortunately, putting the discussion on climate change, sustainability, ESG, and the back burner, and that's inevitable. So consequently, the pursuit of sustainability ESG is adversely impacted, and I think it's happening around the world. Uh, certain jurisdictions, um, there's a redefinition of what green energy means. You know, gas is now defined as part of uh, green energy in certain jurisdictions. Um, I personally feel it should not because, you know, it's based on fossil fuel. I could be wrong, but that's my opinion. Uh, and you can also see some nations have started to recommission new coal fire power plants. Um, and when you speak about the public sector, some of the fiscal priorities, uh, initially there were 
some deployment of funds towards climate change. But now it's about alleviating cost of living uh, rather than funding you know, climate change efforts. And if I can quote, you know, I actually went to Cambridge. Uh, I studied economics there. So you know, I'm actually influenced by uh, John Maynard Keynes, who actually said, in the long run, we are all dead. So henceforth, we do have sight of the long-term goal, but we need to survive today. So at the financial industry level, whilst we do want to talk about climate change, and I think you know, Dr. Sherry mentioned about the regulatory um, drive, it is real. Um, and customers do talk about needing uh, additional funding and working capital. Uh, but because of the need to survive today, even for financial institutions, whilst we are not ignoring our efforts to help the conversation to mitigate climate risks, but we are also skewing our resources and focus to help our customers um, to survive you know, through repayment assistance, restructuring, reschedulement, providing working capital so that they can actually alleviate and manage the cash flows. So the simple answer is, in conclusion, long term should not change. We just need to repivot, maybe focus on the S pillar. And yes, the conversation is very much about how do we actually survive the next couple of years. So um, with that, Dr. Singh, uh, I'll pass back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Sekwan. Simple, simple answer, but but unfortunately, life, if it was so simple, we would all be in a very happy place. On that note, I request Heather to run a poll for us. The second poll, Heather, could you do that kindly so we could actually understand? Yes, and the poll is very clear. Now that you've heard this, this amazing also panel speak, how would now you rate the importance of responsible banking in your day-to-day -day role? Ladies and gentlemen, so a short of time, we'll give you exactly 30 seconds starting now. Please vote. Fantastic. This panel has had a great effect. We should all pat ourselves on the shoulder then, isn't it? I mean, increasingly, 60% increasingly, very 37%. There's still 1% of naysayers. That's one out of the 156. You're a very bad person. Let's go out for a coffee. I'll influence you. Maybe some cognac after this. All right. Uh, but but all sort of dull, 97% is, I mean, I mean, it's, it's good. I think I think the Chartered Bank Institute should invite us for much more panels. Now, before we end, while I've been warned by Heather that we're out of time, there is one question which I would like to put up to Vian. And this question came in from Caroline, and I'm sorry, I can't take any other questions as of now. And the question is very pertinent. How aligned are the financial regulators globally on sustainability and responsible banking? Oh, such a good question. It's This has been so prevalent in the discussions around even nature regulation following on cli from climate regulation, because policymakers are looking to finance institutions for backing to in to implement appropriate regulation in the nature space so the the alignment of industry with policymakers is a translation gap that needs to be fixed it's extraordinary actually it's extraordinary to see how things like moving into COP15, the global biodiversity renegotiation of the global goals that we're going to set ourselves as a, as a, as a global community for the next 20 years. Ha has there been enough dialogue between finance and policymakers? St still more needs to happen. So not only is there a disconnect there, but you're quite right. The alignment of policymakers across the world is also something that needs to continue to happen. If we look at something like Paris and, and now look at where we are today, so the Paris Climate Agreement, it's actually phenomenal that that got done. Uh, if we start to see the different tensions, the different um, needs, the different um, requirements of countries around the world, which is in the hands of the policymakers, that is a crucial piece of alignment that has to happen between regulators. There are some bright spots though. So if I look at task force for climate related disclosures, we're starting to see adoption of that across different jurisdictions slowly, slowly. So I'm hopeful, uh, but I would say that there needs to be more work done on how we align uh, policymakers, 100% right. Yeah, Thank so, you so uh, much, Professor, Ryan. may I just add, a couple of points 
20 seconds. That's all you have. Okay. I agree with uh, Dr. Sharif. There are some bright spots, uh, at least in the financial services sector. You know, I think the central bankers have, you know, managed to get the act together, like TCFD. And then you've got the NGFS, the Network for Greening of Financial Services, which are coming up with the common scenarios for us to do scenario analysis and stress tests. And I think in the accounting world, there's also convergence, the ISSB. Um, you know, it's actually amalgamation of a number of acronyms, CDP, CDSB, uh, SSSB, and what have you. But, you know, Dr. Sharif is spot on. There's only some, you know, green shoots but a lot of work, especially uh, for the regulators uh, not pertaining to the financial services sector. So the gap between the financial services and the real economy, still a lot of work that needs to be done. So thank you for the, my, the, my 20 seconds. Thank you, Ekwan. You went five seconds over time. You were 25 seconds, <laughs> but I'll, I'll forgive you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is a great conversation, but like all good things, they must come to an end. If you have any more questions, reach out to us on LinkedIn. I'm sure I would be happy to add you and talk to you. And I'm sure so would my panelists. We are all here to make this world a better place, even though it may sound very naive. But remember, great ideas are very simple in their, in, in their very essence. On that note, I would also like to thank Simon, you know, I mean, uh, for sorry, Steve, for a fantastic keynote session that he gave today. I look forward to you joining us tomorrow for day two, which is the final day of the conference, where, you, you know, my colleague Joy McKnight will be the chair. And of course, you'll be having keynote speeches by Simone Detling from UNEPFI. And of course, my dear friend, Simon Thompson, who is CEO of the Chartered Bank Institute. And the panel session tomorrow will be talking about why responsible banking values matter. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, and whatever else time you keep over there. It's been a pleasure and a privilege sharing this absolutely phenomenal panel today. And I hope we've been able to add some value and some insights towards your decision-making processes as you move forward. To my panelists, it's been an absolute pleasure being with you on this panel. And I hope to see all of you soon, virtually or in the real world, now that we can fly again. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, have a very, very good day forward for you. Take care. Cheers. Bye.